How's it going everybody and welcome back to another pool coaching video. Today I'd like you to meet Jameson. Now he comes to us as an APA skill level 6 in 8 ball and a skill level 7 in 9 ball and he was interested in knowing what type of advice I could offer him to help improve his game. So he provided us three racks of 8 ball that we're going to watch and at the end of each rack I'll go back to what I think are key areas where I can offer him some type of advice that can hopefully help improve his game. So let's get started. All right, Jameson, show us what you got with this first rack. And just so everyone's aware, the reason why you're not going to be able to hear any sounds throughout the video is because he was playing with music in the background, which unfortunately I did have to mute. Alright, it looks like you performed what I like to call the classic break, and we were able to see that the three ball, which was in the corner of the rack, it did go its expected full rail route, and almost fell in its expected corner pocket, but unfortunately, we did break dry on this first rack. So now as player two, what set are you going to start with? Checking out the one ball and the ten ball there. From the layout of the table, I would have to guess stripe starting with the 12 ball here. Let's see what you do. Okay, good shot. It looks like we might have under hit that a little bit as we were trying to get position for the 13 ball. So now what I'm curious about with the angle that you have on the 13 ball, are you going to try to separate that 1 and 10? Okay, it looks like maybe that's what you were trying to do, but maybe the 10 ball goes all by itself and the one ball actually isn't in the way. All right, so you're lining it up, so I guess it goes all by itself. It's not blocked by the one ball. Okay, a bit of an undercut there, so now we return back to player one with solids. Let's see what you do here. All right, looks like you're lining up for the four ball. What's going to be your next shot after that? Came back up table, and where we're at, we have plenty of options to choose from. Okay, good shot on the three ball. Did we get position on the five? Because that would be good. We could be done with that half of the table and only have to worry about the other half of the table for the remainder of the rack. Okay, we did. Good. So cue ball should be coming back to the other half of the table. Looks like you're probably going to be choosing between the four ball or the six ball. Can't really tell if the four ball can go by the six from this camera angle. You lined it up, so does it go? Okay, 
Oh, never mind. You chose the six ball instead. Good shot. Okay, so between the 1, 4, and 7, which ball is going to be your key ball to get position on the 8? All right, it's not going to be the 1 ball. We're going to take that out. Judging by that position, you're going to play the 7 ball next. So your 4 ball is going to be the key ball. Okay, good shot. Got a little bit of an angle there. So are you going to be able to keep the cue ball on what would be my right side of the eight ball? Or are you going to bring it over to your right side of the eight ball and shoot it in the same pocket as the four? Okay, good. We kept control of the cue ball. We'll be shooting the eight ball in the opposite corner pocket. Okay, double checking where the ghost ball might be. Good shot. Okay, so that was a good start here. We finished off the first rack in only one inning, winning the rack as player one. I did see a couple of spots that I can actually provide some comments on, so let's go back and take a look at them. And this is the first spot in rack one that I'm going to comment on, which is going to be with your break. Now, I'm not commenting on your break because you broke dry. I'm commenting on your break because of what you did during your break. So let's check it out. So we can see here that the cue ball has not even struck the rack yet, and you've already picked up your bridge hand, which therefore picks up your cue off of the table. And anytime I see a player do this, I have to ask them, are you aware of when exactly are you doing this? Are you picking up your cue before contacting the cue ball, during contacting the cue ball, or after contacting the cue ball? Now, if you're at least doing it after you contact the cue ball, there's not really that big of a deal. I just think it opens up a window of opportunity for it to happen during contacting the cue ball and even before contacting the cue ball. Now, if you're picking up your cue before you contact the cue ball, then the problem that you're going to run into is, say you want to hit the cue ball directly in the center. If you're picking up your cue before you contact the cue ball, then most likely you're going to end up putting a little bit of topspin on the cue ball, which is probably not what you're wanting to do if you're really wanting to hit the cue ball directly in the center. And then if you're picking up your cue during contacting the cue ball, then that's most likely what's going to cause your cue to miss cue off of the cue ball. So during your break, I'd like you to stay down a little bit longer for at least half a second to maybe even a full second. Have your cue go completely through the cue ball with a good follow through and then finally stand up from the shot. You've got plenty of time before any of the balls actually make their way down to the other end of the table and run into your cue so you don't have to really worry about fouling. Just make sure that you get a good clean hit right through the cue ball, stay down and don't pick up your bridge hand until you're well aware that you followed completely through the cue ball and make a good clean hit. Here is the next spot I'd like to comment on. You're about to shoot the two ball into the upper left corner pocket, which I had mistakenly called the four ball earlier. Now, you had made the shot, but I did happen to notice that you have a bad habit during your stroke. So what I'd like you to pay attention to is look where your grip hand starts and then look where it ends when I replay this shot in slow motion. We see that you move your grip hand closer to your body, which gives you a stroke line that looks like this, 
rather than a stroke line that is straight back and straight forward. So what this is telling me is that you're wanting to put some amount of right spin and probably combined with some top spin so you can get to the short rail there. But since you're moving your grip hand closer to your body, this goes back to my previous comment to where when exactly are you moving your grip hand like this? Because it's more than likely going to be before you contact the cue ball, which is going to end up putting more right spin on the cue ball than you're probably wanting. Now this actually worked out for you okay because you made the shot and you got position on the three ball to which you used to get position back onto the five ball. But if you're wanting to put more right spin than what you started with, then wherever you want to hit the cue ball is where your tip should start and you should focus on your grip hand just moving straight back and straight forward through the cue ball, giving you a good clean follow through and not twisting your arm one way or the other or bringing your grip hand closer to your body which causes the tip of your cue to pivot right. And then if you move your grip hand further away from your body, it causes the tip of your cue to pivot left. So try to focus on keeping your grip hand still and just moving straight back and straight forward to give you a good clean hit. And this will be the final spot in rack one that I'm going to comment on. After getting position back onto the five ball and taking care of that end of the table, you returned back to this half of the table and you had gestured like you were going to shoot the four ball here into the corner pocket. But then you ended up shooting the six ball into the corner pocket instead, which turned out to be in your favor because you ran out the rest of the table. So the only real reason why I'm wanting to comment on this spot is how far exactly are you planning in your runouts? Because when you made the five ball into the corner pocket here, were you intending on getting position on the four ball, but since you got down on the shot and realized that's probably not the best shot you should have done, then you did a backup shot to the six ball? I'm not entirely sure. I'm only bringing this up because you're also a nine ball player. And in nine ball, we don't do stuff like that. We play for the position that we're wanting to play on the next ball because we know what the next ball is going to be. And if we don't get exactly where we want to be, we decide whether or not if we're still going to take the intended shot or if we're going to play some sort of safety, which is the point of my comment here. When you knew that you were going to shoot the five ball into this corner pocket here, I would have expected you to already have a plan as to what your next ball was going to be. And if you didn't get the position that you were wanting on that next ball, then you would end up playing some sort of backup shot or potentially doing a safety. Now, you probably had all of that in mind. It was just really hard to tell considering that you were measuring to shoot the four ball after you had shot the five ball. So I just want to make sure that this planning is actually inside of your head that before you shoot the next shot, you already know what that next shot is going to be. And then depending upon the position that your cue ball gets, you'll decide whether or not if you're going to follow through with your plan or have to come up with an entirely different plan. So this is what I have for you on rack one. Let's see what you can do with rack two. So here we are now with rack two. You're off to a great start finishing rack one in only one inning. So let's see how you can do with this rack. Okay, it looks like we got the head ball to go into the side pocket, which is where it's supposed to go if you do the classic break correctly. It did get a little bit of help from another ball to kick its way into the side pocket, but at least it still dropped. So you're starting off rack two as player one, since player one won the previous rack, and you made a stripe on the break. So what stripe is going to be your opening shot? It's more than likely going to be the 14 ball. Okay, and I absolutely love that you're looking at the rest of the stripes before you decide on the 14 ball here. So you're at least fully aware of where the rest of your balls are going to be on this layout. All right, good shot there. We got position on the nine ball. This will actually be a good key ball for you to get position on. I think that's the 12 ball there next to the eight ball. You can even use the four ball to help you out to hold the cue ball there for position on the 12. Okay, you're even looking at it, so you know that's probably going to be the next ball that you're going to want to shoot. Oh, 
Oh, but we hit it just a little bit too hard. Maybe you were trying to bump into the four ball. It's really hard to tell, or you just did hit it too hard. So from here, it looks like you can only do something with the 11 ball. Let's see what you come up with. More importantly, how do you plan on getting position back onto that stripe that you failed to get position on? All right, so it looks like you might be trying the 11 ball into the upper left corner pocket. Did we make it? We did not, and it looks like the two ball is also closer to the corner pocket, so your 11 ball must have clipped the two ball and then hit the short rail and then came back to where now it's tied up with the two ball. So now as player two with solids, what is going to be the opening shot? Oh, so a long shot on the six ball here. Referencing the ghost ball. Nicely done. You look a little disappointed there. Maybe you just didn't get exactly the position that you want on the five ball, but it does look makeable. Okay, good shot there. Good control on the cue ball. Looks like you have position on the four ball or the seven ball. And the seven ball is actually a good shot so that way you can break out your two ball that's tied up with the 11 near the upper left corner pocket. Looks like that's what you're measuring for. Okay, we got the breakout, but did we make the shot? Nope, there's the seven ball, so that's unfortunate. All right, back over to player one. More than likely going to be starting with the 11 ball. Okay, it looks like you're trying to hold position on the cue ball here. All right, nicely done. So that gives you position on the 13 ball. Will you be taking the opportunity now to try to push the 8 ball away from what I still believe to be the 12 ball? Okay, nicely done. Do we have a shot? It doesn't look like it. I can't really tell how much of the 12 ball you can actually see now that I can see that it is actually the 12 ball. Maybe you can actually bank it or you just have to go for the 15 ball at the other end of the table. Okay, so it looks like we're going to be shooting the 15 ball and you're trying to figure out where you want your cue ball to land so you can have position on the 12 ball. OK, 
Okay, referencing the ghost ball. Ooh, looks like we way overcut that one there. All right, so now let's go back to player two. If we follow the same principle that you did over in rack one, if you take out the two ball now, then you're completely done with that half of the table, and you only have to focus on smaller cue ball movements being at this half of the table. At this point here, do you have an entire runout pattern in mind? How far exactly are you planning ahead? All right, so from here, I would think that you're probably going to play the one ball. Okay, we played the three ball instead. Good shot. That repositions us back onto the one ball or the four ball. So which ball is going to be the key ball for the eight ball? Either one of them work. Okay, so we're going to shoot the one ball into the side pocket and draw back for position on the four. Oh, but we didn't get the draw you were looking for. You're still okay because the four ball is makeable, but now you're at an angle to where it doesn't look like you're going to be able to hold position on the cue ball for the eight ball in the opposite pocket. You're more than likely going to have to bring the cue ball to rails and shoot the eight ball in the same pocket as the four ball. Yep, pretty much what you're drawing there. Okay, good shot. Good position on the eight ball. I like the ghost ball referencing. Nothing wrong with making sure you know exactly where you want to send that cue ball. Nicely done. Okay, so that was really good. I think that was another one inning rack there, but this time we won as player two. So just like before, I only saw a few spots that we can go over. So let's go take a look at them. Here's the first spot I'd like to comment on. This is during your run with stripes as player one after the break. And you're currently trying to see if you're going to be able to shoot the 11 ball past the two ball into the corner pocket. And you must be able to because you went ahead and tried it. But from the camera angle that you've given me here, it does appear that the amount of space in order to successfully pass by the two ball is really, really small. And that was apparent when we saw that you missed the shot because the two ball had to have been clipped as it moved over here. And that caused your 11 ball to come and hit the short rail and then land right behind the two ball. 
Now, normally from what I've seen, when you have a shot to where you only have a very, very small gap in order to be able to get the object ball to pass an imposing ball to go into a pocket, you end up shooting the cue ball with a lot of finesse and not really try to muscle the cue ball into the next position for the next shot, which is pretty much what you did. And that's why we saw your cue ball land over here. So had you been successful at making the 11 ball, it's just really hard to tell whether or not if you'd have been able to shoot the 15 ball past the four ball into the lower right corner pocket. So because of all that, that's the reason why I probably would have suggested trying to bank the 11 ball into the lower left corner pocket. Because at the very least, we're going to have more control over the cue ball. Because with some bottom right spin, we can get the cue ball to come right over here in between the 1 and the 7 and get position for the 13 ball to go here into the side pocket. That should automatically allow you to get position for the 15 ball to go into the corner pocket here, or you can try to get position on the 14. But at least from the 15 ball at the apparent angle, you should be able to get from the 13. You should be able to get position on the 14 ball to go into the lower left corner pocket. Now, between banking the 11 ball or trying to cut it past the 2 ball, I think they both share the same amount of level of difficulty. It's just that with the bank shot, I think you'd be able to have more control over the cue ball. And also, if you're unsuccessful at making it, then hopefully you actually block this pocket from the 5 ball and the 6 ball, which is pretty much the same thing that you did when you were unsuccessful at making it in the upper left corner pocket because you then blocked the 2 ball. So I think all of those put together, the only reason why I would suggest banking the 11 ball is because you'd actually be able to have more control over your cue ball. Here's the next spot I'd like to comment on. This is just after missing the 11 ball in the upper left corner pocket. And now as player two, you're about to try to shoot the six ball into the lower left corner pocket and you were successful. Your cue ball comes and hits the side rail and then lands somewhere right about over here, which you look to be a little disappointed in that shot as I don't think the cue ball landed exactly where you wanted to. But that was okay because you were able to cut the five ball into the same corner pocket and your cue ball goes two rails like this and I think lands somewhere right around here for position on the seven ball, which then your run ended as player two. Now, the only reason why I'm commenting on this spot is because of the use of the closed hand bridge while on the rail. Personally, I would use the open hand V bridge because with the closed hand bridge, you're now adding more elevation to your cue than necessary. With the open hand V bridge, I typically would place my fingertips on the end of the rail and that allows me to lower my bridge to where I can actually be pretty much right on top of the rail with a slight elevation so that I don't miscue over the top of the cue ball. But that slight elevation that I'm suggesting is still smaller than the elevation that you have here. And the reason why I want to suggest that is because we already saw from previous shots that you do have a tendency to move your grip hand from side to side during your stroke, which could cause you to accidentally put side spin on the cue ball. And anytime you accidentally put side spin on the cue ball when you have an elevated cue like this is going to cause your cue ball to curve or masse on the way to the object ball, which could cause you to miss. Now, fortunately, that didn't happen on this shot here, but we did see it happen on a later shot, which we're going to talk about next. And this is the next shot that I was talking about. Because now as player one, you're about to try to shoot the 15 ball into the upper right corner pocket. And we know that's what you're trying to do because we saw you measure it up right here. But we also see here that you're still using the closed hand bridge on top of the rail. And we can see the amount of elevation that you have here on the cue ball. Which is really not a lot, but it's still enough to where if you accidentally put side spin on the cue ball, then your cue ball is going to curve. Now, with the open hand V bridge, the elevation of the cue is reduced to about here, which is still going to allow you to be just a little bit more accurate, even if you were to throw a little bit of side spin on the cue ball. Now, that's what must have happened on this shot. You must have accidentally put side spin on the cue ball, or maybe you purposely put side spin on the cue ball because we saw your cue ball do something like this and stay pretty much around this area here. 
because we saw that the 15 ball was extremely overcut and it hit the short rail and then worked its way up here and almost comboed the 12 ball into the lower right corner pocket. But this is my point on when you have more elevation on the cue ball than needed, if you accidentally put any type of side spin on the cue ball, then your cue ball is going to curve on its way over to the object ball. And I think that's exactly what happened here, which is why I primarily suggest using the open hand V bridge anytime that you're having to bridge on the rail, like on this particular shot here. And this will be the final spot in rack two that I'm going to comment on. Now back as player two, we can see that you're about to shoot the one ball into the side pocket and you had indicated to us that you wanted your cue ball to stop somewhere right around here for position on the four ball. And that's why we can see you cueing on the cue ball with bottom spin because you need the cue ball to draw back to the position that you're wanting. But we also saw that the cue ball didn't draw back at all. So let's watch this shot again in slow motion and figure out why. So here we can see that you pretty much have no follow through because I would have expected your cue to at least stop somewhere right around here, which is just past the cue ball instead of where the cue ball was laying on the table. So what that tells me is that you're decelerating your stroke on the way to the cue ball and that's what allows you to accurately stop right after making contact on the cue ball. Because now if I were to play the rest of the shot, we can see that your cue ball just starts to roll forward which tells me that you performed a drag shot. And that's where the cue ball is spinning backwards on the way to the object ball, but then that backspin dies out and the cue ball slides and then starts to roll forward. And on your shot here, your cue ball was rolling forward before it made contact with the one ball. So pretty much what I can say on this shot, or any shot for that matter, is make sure that you're actually following through the cue ball. Your deceleration should actually begin right when you're making contact with the cue ball and not before making contact with the cue ball. So I'm pretty sure the reason why you shot it this way is because you were probably worried about overdrawing the cue ball. So that's just going to take some practice to have more control on your cue ball to make sure that you can actually draw it and get the position that you're wanting. So this is what I got for you on rack two. Now let's see what you can do with the final rack. All right, Jameson, you're doing great finishing off two racks in only two innings. Let's see what you got with the final rack. Okay, this time I saw that the head ball, which was the 12 ball, went straight over to the side pocket without any assistance. So that was a good execution of the classic break. So player two won the previous rack. So here's player two again on this rack, starting with stripes. Most likely it's going to be with the 11 ball. Okay, so it looks like you have position on the nine ball, or are you going to shoot the 15 ball or even the 10 ball? The nine ball would be a good choice because the five, six, and seven pretty much block all the paths to it except for the window that you're currently sitting in right now. Okay, some hesitation there. Are you about to draw off of the nine ball and maybe try to open up your 14 ball? Yep, I think that's what you were trying to do. We just missed the five ball and now we're completely hooked behind the one ball there. So we're going to have to kick at something. Okay, so it looks like you're too close to the one ball to kick to the left side rail and probably use left spin to try to hit the 10 ball. Okay, 
not entirely sure what you might be measuring up for. Is this a one rail kick shot on the 14 ball? That looks like what you were trying to do, but unfortunately we fouled. So now we have ball in hand with player one. Let's see which solid you're going to start with. All right, I like that you're going to start with the six ball because I agree that that is the hardest ball on the table to play position on, so you can pretty much start with it. Looks like we follow forward to get position on the two ball for the lower left corner pocket. I'm not entirely sure what ball we're trying to play position on next. Maybe it's the one ball or possibly the five ball, but it doesn't look like we we made it. Looks like you're a little short. Because I don't think the three ball passes by the one ball. What are we shooting at? Hmm, so I think you were probably trying to shoot the five ball and didn't realize that you were going to clip the seven ball. Or maybe it's just because you were bridged over the three ball that you couldn't apply the correct spin or no spin at all and you accidentally hit the seven ball. So now back over to stripes. Measuring up for the 14 ball. Looks like you have a pretty wired 15-13 combination there for the lower left corner pocket as well. Okay, good shot there. You have position on, I think that's the 10 ball for the side pocket, and you also have the combination. Which one are you going to choose? Okay, so it's going to be the combination. We have to make sure we know where that 15 ball is going. Okay, so it looks like we might have overshot the, the cue ball, but you should be able to still cut the 15 ball into the lower left corner pocket. You actually had a pretty similar shot before, I think with the 5 ball, kind of like in the same position where you had to back cut it into the lower left corner pocket.
Oh, it looked like, yeah, we overcut the ball. That's unfortunate. And we also hit it a little too hard because we wouldn't have had position on the 10 ball. It looks like the three ball blocks the path to the 10 ball from where the cue ball's at. So back over to player one as solids. Looks like you're checking if the three ball can pass by the 10 ball. Okay, so that must be for position on the one ball. Yeah, so you can probably try to just follow through it and play the three ball in the opposite side pocket. Oh, we caught the point of the side pocket. Just barely missed it. Okay, so it looks like now we have a wired combination here between the 10 ball and the 15 ball. Wait, are you going to try to mass say around the 10 ball? I wouldn't really suggest that. I wouldn't even suggest trying to jump over the 10 ball. Just play the combination. Okay, now it looks like you might be trying to cut the 10 ball into the side pocket. And it looks like we undercut the ball. It looks like we have a pattern now to where we start working our way up to the other half of the table, starting with the one ball. The three ball should be next. Now, do you follow forward here for position on the seven? Or do you try to draw back for position on the five? Okay, so it looked like the last three remaining balls should be going into the lower right corner pocket. I'm guessing it's going to be 7, 5, and then 8. Okay, nice shot there. Five ball should be going into the same corner pocket with one rail position on the eight ball.
Okay, good shot there. We got decent position on the eight. Can we finish this off? Oh, we just barely missed the eight ball. That's unfortunate. Oh, man. Maybe we can win this rack as player two. Yeah, what order are you going to shoot these last two stripes in? getting the bridge out so we're gonna shoot the 15 ball where are we shooting the 10 ball okay so into the left side pocket That's pretty much the type of bridge that I was talking about that you should be using whenever you're that close to the rail. The open hand V bridge rather than the closed bridge sitting on top of the rail. Okay, there we go. So this rack actually gave you the most trouble. I think it took a few innings to actually get through it. So we actually do have a few spots on this one to go through. So let's go take a look at them. Here's the first spot in rack three that I wanted to comment on. As player two, you're about to try to shoot the nine ball into the corner pocket here. And with bottom spin, I think you were trying to draw the cue ball back into the five ball so that you can move it away from the 14 ball and possibly have a path here into the corner pocket. Or maybe you were trying to bump the five and have it bump the 14 more out into the open so it has access to this side pocket here. I'm not entirely sure. But... You ended up overdrawing the cue ball so much to where it drew back and missed the five ball and came all the way back to the short rail and then got hooked behind the one ball to where you tried to do a one rail kick shot on the 14 ball and missed it entirely, giving player one ball in hand with solids. Now, trying to break the five ball away from the 14 ball or maybe push the 14 ball more out into the open was not a bad decision. But I do think you have an easier option which is to shoot the nine ball in and just hold the cue ball right here where the nine ball's at. Because from here, that should allow you to shoot the 13 ball into this corner pocket and your cue ball will naturally go this way and probably bump the eight ball more out into the open. Your cue ball should land somewhere right around here and that should give you a shot at the 14 ball into the side pocket because it does look like it can go from this camera angle. But, Let's say that it can't though. You still have the 15 ball that you can shoot at and after you move the 10 ball out of the way, you should be able to bank the 14 ball into the side pocket. So again, I don't wanna say that you trying to move the five or move the 14 ball in the open was a bad decision to make, but I think we can both agree that just trying to make the nine ball and hold position on the cue ball is probably an easier thing to do because it's easier to control the cue ball with less cue ball movement. And that's why I would suggest this shot here rather than the one that you tried. Here is the next spot in the rack that I wanted to talk about. This is right after overdrawing from the nine ball and now you're hooked behind the one ball and we know that you're going to try to do a one rail kick shot in order to hit the 14 ball. We just saw that you went wide and missed the 14 ball altogether and then fouled after hitting the five ball. So what we can see from this position here is that you're shooting rather uncomfortably. You're having to bridge over the one ball. You're only standing on one foot because this foot looks like it's in the air or maybe it's on its tiptoe. So what I want to offer here is two other alternatives that possibly would be a little bit more comfortable because I don't think you'll be bridging over the one ball. And the first one is to try a three rail kick shot from this angle here. 
What I see that you can try to do is shoot the cue ball into the side rail here and then with some left spin have the cue ball come off the short rail back over to this side rail and then possibly hit the 10 ball from here. Now you're going to have to hit this one with a little bit more speed because after making contact with the 10 ball you got to get something to hit a rail. Either the cue ball, the 10 ball, or maybe even the other balls. But if you're coming at the 10 ball from this angle here, we can see that the 10 ball is probably going to head up over here and maybe disturb the other balls, which is really no different than what you would have done if you were successful at kicking the 14 ball. You probably would have disturbed the 5 or the 6. The other shot that I would suggest, which I actually highly suggest this one, is a 2 rail kick shot and possibly hitting the 15 ball, maybe even pocketing it into this corner pocket here. Because at least with this shot here, if you do miss it, you don't really run any type of risk of disturbing any of the other balls, like how you had done when you had kicked the 14 ball. Now you were fortunate when you had done that because you kicked the six ball over by the eight ball, but that didn't really matter since you had ball in hand because that was the ball that you actually started with. So when you're going to do a kick shot because you have to or because your opponent played safety, you don't always have to necessarily look at one rail kick shots because those are the easiest to calculate. There are systems to where you can actually successfully do two rail kick shots like this and three rail kick shots that take you over to the corner. And if you know how to get to the corner, then you know how to get to a track line to where possibly you're going to miss by an entire diamond, which would allow you to hit the 10 ball. I will actually cover those in future videos. But at least here, I want you to be aware of all your possible options before you decide on just a one rail kick shot. And this is going to be the final spot in rack three that I'm going to comment on. Now, you had heard me mention while you were lining up for this shot, why you didn't try to do a 10-15 combination. Especially when it looked like you were going to try to masse around the 10 ball or maybe even jump over the 10 ball to make the 15 ball. Instead, you lined up like this, and you were trying to cut the 10 ball into the side pocket. You just undercut it and caught the point just above the side pocket. So again, I'm going to ask why you didn't try to do a 10-15 combination like this. Were you worried that the cue ball was going to scratch into the side pocket? If so, just put bottom spin on the cue ball and hit the cue ball soft enough to where you know that the 10 ball will make its way down here to make the 15 ball, but because you hit the cue ball softer, the backspin on the cue ball will take effect almost right after contacting the 10 ball, and your cue ball should draw below the side pocket, catch the side rail, and then bounce back out like this. And the only thing you have to worry about now is how the 10 ball contacts the 15 ball. Because you really want to have a head-on hit so the 10 ball replaces the 15 ball, therefore giving you another shot to shoot the 10 ball in the same pocket. Because otherwise, if you cut that 15 ball in, then your 10 ball will more than likely catch the short rail here and then come back out like this to where you have to back cut the 10 ball into the corner pocket like how you've done with previous shots from the previous racks. Even though the cut shot does look possible, it looks to be about an 85, maybe even more degree of a cut shot. That is almost next to impossible because of cut induced throw. And what I mean by that is when a cue ball makes contact with an object ball for a cut angle, they don't just instantly separate. What actually happens is the cue ball and the object ball will travel together for a brief moment and then separate, which is probably why your 10 ball came short and caught the point just above the side pocket, which means you need to cut the 10 ball more thinner than what she actually did. And that means your cue ball is going to be going up and down the table which is why I think the combination was just an easier option for you to do, and you should have been able to control the cue ball to be able to avoid the scratch. So this is, again, to stress the idea of making sure you're fully aware of what all of your options are. I saw you go through at least three options, which was to masse around the 10 ball, maybe even jump over the 10 ball, but then you ended up trying to cut the 10 ball into the side pocket. So do know that you did have a fourth option, which was to play this 10-15 combination, which should have been easier to execute, and you probably could have been able to finish the table. So Jameson, this is what I have for you after seeing these three racks of eight ball. 
even though this last rack gave you the most trouble, you were able to finish off all three racks in only five innings, which I think is fantastic. I think the biggest thing you should be able to take away from this video is making sure you're fully aware of what all of your options are on each shot and then choosing the one that is actually the easier one to do, which gives you the higher chance at being successful at. At least that was the main point that I tried to emphasize on the last rack here. So let me say thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to review your game. I hope that the advice that I was able to give during these three racks will actually be able to find helpful to help improve your game so that way you can find yourself making it to skill level 7 and 8 ball and then climbing in 9 ball to level 8 and then eventually level 9. So for my viewers, what do you think of that? Do you agree or disagree with any of my points? Or do you see other types of options or other types of patterns that Jameson could have done? If so, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below with the timestamp of the shot and the advice or the runout pattern that you think you would have given. So if you like what you saw, give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Take care, everybody.